Right now, it's time to bring in Arthur Schwartz, the food maven. Now, Arthur, of course, joins us on a Monday. We rebroadcast it later on in the week and also on the weekends because people can't get enough. He's like chocolate cake. You just can't get enough with a nice old ice-cold glass of milk. <laughs> Good morning, chocolate Arthur. Chocolate cake. <laughs> I, it's the only time I used to like to drink milk, ice-cold milk and uh, chocolate cake. Listen, I still, I, <laughs> <laughs> even yesterday, <laughs> I had to have the last piece of this chocolate cake with a glass of milk. Um, yes, unquestionably, they go together. Yeah. So this is not any old chocolate cake that I made, and I'm going to make again today. Um, there's a little bit of a saga here. This is a, a, something called a torta caprese. Now, the word torta in Italian means cake, just generic cake, and it's applied to any number of things. However, in English, as well as in, I guess it's German-Austrian, a tort is something very particular. It is a cake baked without flour, usually with ground nuts um, as the substance of the cake, and eggs are the leavening. The yolks get beaten very uh, uh, thick and incorporate a lot of air when you do that. And then the whites, we all know about egg whites, they hold quite a bit of air once you beat them. So this cake, I don't know, I think all, I, I have a recipe for this cake in Naples at Table, which was published uh, 22, three years ago. And, of course, the recipe uh, I, I had and and made several times, if not many times, before the book was published. So I've been baking this cake for at least 25 years. But I haven't made it lately. And But all of a sudden, I noticed on, I told you last week and maybe the week before too, I've been watching way too much TV <laughs> uh, in the house, stuck here. I do a lot of other things, but, you know, the TV beckons. Anyway, and I even flashed through uh, or skipped through some food uh, 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 shows. And I, somehow this torta caprese has been showing up on TV. So I decided I have to make a torta caprese. Besides that, it's very difficult to buy anything but packaged baked goods around here. Uh, the good bakeries have pretty much closed. Um, I, and everybody's baking. I mean, in the beginning of the, of, of the lockdown, uh, you couldn't get flour uh, in, in the supermarket. It, it, they just... Everybody wiped them out of flour. And then I have a friend who bakes bread, and she had to order yeast online in some bulk amount. In fact, she called me and she said, can I, can I stop by your place and drop off some yeast? I have way too much yeast, but I'm not baking bread. But I did decide I needed to bake some kind of sweet. So the torta caprese was it. Now, I have this recipe in Naples at Table, it's a recipe that I got from a friend in, in, uh, who lives in Salerno. Um, and uh, I went, I, her mother is, I mean, she's my friend too. She's a woman in her 40s. Uh, but her mother, who's a woman more my age, <laughs> is, is the first friend. And her mother's a superb, superb cook. Her mo I mean, Rosaria is maybe, she's up certainly in the top five cooks that I know. Anyway, um, so we, go, I go, we all go to Rosaria on Sunday for family meals. Uh, actually, Rosaria has five daughters, and there are so many children and grandchildren. She has to divide, and she has a very big house still. She has to divide the family. One week, this group comes. The next week, another group comes. But one one Sunday, we get the torta caprese for dessert, and it's the best I've ever had. Now, let me say, torta caprese is the most ubiquitous cake in Naples and surrounding areas. Uh, it's, of course, obviously, named for the island of Capri. That's why it's called caprese. It means something from Capri. The cake is sold everywhere. In, you know, it's in restaurants. It's in bakeries. People make it. I would say most of the time it is not a very appealing cake because it's dry and sometimes really heavy. However, my friend Rosalia's uh, recipe is among the best I've ever had, so that's how it ended up in Naples at Table. 
And I decided that's what I'm going to make. That's the version I'm going to make. Although if you go online, you're going to find other versions. Now, I did go online because I was just curious, like, how has, uh, you know, I mean, all these Food Network people are making it. There must be, must be recipes online. And sure enough, there are many recipes online. And you know what? Most of them are my recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Not all. Like, Jada De Laurentiis has one less egg in hers than in my recipe. But I did find one that was not only my recipe, but – now, I'm not suing anybody. But the only thing that you legally can copyright in a recipe is not the list of ingredients, uh, not even the directions if you rewrite the directions. The only thing that is copyrightable is the unique expression of those directions, because that's the only prose in a recipe. I guess somebody could plagiarize the head notes, the introduction to a recipe, but who would do that? <clears throat> and, um, but, but if you have the same wording as the original recipe, or anybody's version of the recipe for that matter, that is copyrightable and you can sue. And in fact, I know, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but 25, 30, well, it's got to be 30 years ago, um, uh, somebody important did sue over, over plagiarized recipes and didn't win, but got a huge settlement. Anyway, back to uh, my torta caprese. So I do find a recipe online that not only uh, has full sentences that are taken directly from my book, but also includes something that I would change if I got to edit my book. Uh, because I know how to, I, I was talking about this a week or two ago on the air. I now know much better about how to mix a cake than I did 25 years ago, anyway. Certainly 50 years ago. So the one thing in that recipe that I would change is that when you want, when you beat egg whites and you want to make them stable, uh, as opposed to fragile, you beat sugar into the egg whites a little bit at a time, a little bit of sugar and a little bit at a time. I'll give you an example. When I make my grandmother's walnut tort, where the main ingredient is ground walnuts and all the leavening is done by eggs, just as in this torta caprese, um, I, she always had us tiptoeing around the house when she had these cakes in the oven. You couldn't close the door. I mean, really, any extra vibration was going to cause this cake to fall. And you know what? Sometimes my grandmother's cakes did fall. But now I know the reason that they fell is not because anybody was slamming a door. is because the egg whites weren't stabilized. So nowadays when I make this cake, I take a couple of tablespoons of the sugar from the rest of the recipe and I incorporate them into the egg whites. After you've beaten your egg whites so that they're all broken up, uh, not yet mounting, but, but starting to mount, uh, you gradually, I mean really just tit, 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 really sprinkle in the sugar, whatever amount of sugar. Usually for, let's say, well, let me say for the torta caprese, which calls for six eggs, six egg yolks separated from six whites. In the six whites, I put four tablespoons of sugar. So in the recipe that I found online that was nearly plagiarized from me, um, she writes exactly what I wrote, which was just add the quarter cup of sugar to the egg whites. Well, I wouldn't do it that way these days. I, I, I would do what I just said, gradually sprinkling it in as I'm beating the egg whites until they're stiff. And by the way, and it's important for the torta caprese to know this, your, your maximum stiffness is when the egg whites, when the in the bowl that's holding the egg whites can be turned upside down, and the egg whites don't move; they stay in the bowl. I learned this trick many, many years ago, and I do it all the time. So it it works. If you see the as you're gradually tipping your bowl over to see if they're going to hold, if you see the egg whites sliding in the bowl, then you know they're not beaten quite enough, even though they may look like they're beaten enough. 
put the mixer back in the in the egg whites and beat for literally another five to ten seconds usually. If it's just sliding out of the bowl, you probably only need five or ten seconds more. Anyway, that's the egg whites. So back to the recipe, the key here is almonds. And, you know, I have all my life I have blanched I mean and blanched and peeled almonds, which means you buy almonds in their husks you put them into boiling water for no more than one minute, drain them, and then usually the husk will slip right off. And those are called blanched almonds. It's a nuisance. Uh, and then you have to let the almonds sit out and dry because you don't want to be grinding up wet almonds. And then you first have to grind them up into what amounts to a flour. It's very finely ground almonds these days they call almond flour because there are so many people making gluten-free desserts or um, I'm not sure exactly what why almond flour is as popular as it is now, but it is. And um, I buy Bob's Red Mill almond flour, which is stupidly expensive in my store. I, I, I actually checked this out the other day. Uh, if you go online... You can buy Bob's Red Mill for seven fifty, a one-pound bag, and you only need twelve ounces for this recipe. That's fair enough. It saves you from a lot of work blanching and grinding almonds. Um, if you want to blanch and grind almonds, I don't think almonds cost more than seven or eight dollars a pound. And I, in the supermarket, in my fancy supermarket, the the almonds were fifteen dollars a bag. In my normal supermarket meaning your chain supermarket, they were only $12 a bag. Uh, as I said, uh, on if you go to Amazon, you'll find Bob's Red Milk for seven fifty, And you can order it and have it delivered to your door. And I think it's on Prime, no charge for delivery if, you're on, if you have Prime. So I'm going to give you the recipe. It's a simple recipe, but it requires a lot of care in putting together. First thing you want to do is in a small saucepan, melt a half a pound of butter. In that, you're going to melt a half a pound of bittersweet or semi-sweet chocolate, whatever you love. I don't use um, uh, chips for this. Chips are processed in a way that they're meant to be st stick together, you know, when you make a chocolate chip cookie. I use bulk chocolate. Uh, baker's ba baking chocolate, any kind of ba uh, uh, baker's uh, semi-sweet chocolate is is perfect for this. If you like the taste of, of of baker's chocolate, which most people do, since we all grew up with eating baker's chocolate, so you melt a half a pound of chocolate, that's eight squares, in a half a pound of butter, that's two sticks, and that's your chocolate. To that, you might want to add um, a little vanilla. I do not because. I must say, vanilla extract is not something that is easily purchased in Italy. In Italy, they usually use a vanilla powder. And uh, I don't see people adding it the way we add vanilla to things. So this is a very Italian recipe. Uh, so there's your chocolate. The, the, the dry ingredients are 12 ounces uh, of ground almonds, of ground blanched almonds, no flour, no leavening, um, and then the base is six egg yolks. Beach, oh, by the way, when I'm grinding almonds in the food processor, because they have a lot of oil in them, um, I, you, had, you, you have to add sugar to the almonds as you grind them so that they don't stick into a paste and they remain a fluffy powder. Um, not doing that nowadays because I can buy what's called almond flour, which is finely ground almonds. Uh, I add six tablespoons of sugar to the almond flour and just stir it in so that I have the same amount of sweetening. In, the, in my mixer bowl, and I do use a stand-up mixer for this because it re egg, eggs are, you know, they require a lot of beating. So you put in your six egg yolks and beat them until they start to thicken up, which usually takes about a minute and a half, two minutes. And then gradually, a tablespoon at a time, 
add 10 tablespoons of sugar. By the way, this whole cake only has a, a cup and a quarter of sugar. It's not, a hot, it's not a very sweet cake. It has no starch at all. It's a gluten-free cake if you must be gluten-free. Um, it's even good for Passover because it has no flour in it, except that it does have a lot of butter. So if you're kosher and you don't want to eat a dessert with butter after a meat meal, which is usually what the Seder meal is, at least the Seder nights, the uh, Passover meal, I should say, then you, you don't want this. But you can eat it during the week when you have a dairy meal because it's all the butter. So you beat the egg yolks until they're very thick and very stiff and very pale with the 10 tablespoons of sugar. And that usually takes another three or four minutes. It, it, don't, don't speed it up. And by the way, I do this on fairly high, uh, not, uh, not necessarily the highest speed, but near the highest speed on my stand-up KitchenAid. If you want to do this with a handheld mixer, you're also going to have to use uh, high speed. Um, when the egg yolks are nice and nice and thick, um, you can add your cooled melted butter and chocolate mixture and stir, and maybe you've added some vanilla to that, and stir in the almond flour, and there's the base. It's going to be extremely thick, very, very dense, but make sure it's all stirred in. You can stir it in. You don't even need the machine to do this. In fact, I took what was in the machine, the egg yolks, and poured them into the bowl that had the uh, the almond flour and sugar uh, so that I could then wash out my mixer bowl, very, uh, dry it extremely thoroughly because you want a very clean bowl to beat egg whites, pour in my six egg whites, and beat them, as I said, until they're all broken up and starting to mount, and then gradually add in four tablespoons of sugar until you have very stiffly beaten egg whites. And now is the is the technique part of the recipe because you need to truly fold the egg whites into this very stiff chocolate base. And uh, folding means taking your spatula. Well, you put the two ingredients that you're folding in the same bowl and you take your spatula and go right down the center of the heap and go around the side of the bowl and bring around what was on the bottom onto the top. And I do this turning my bowl, turning my bowl. I, you know, so I, As I fold, I turn the bowl. I only do one-third of the egg whites to start because you need to lighten up that, um, that chocolate mixture, the chocolate almond mixture. And then by the, and the, by the time you're finished with the second edition, you will see of, of egg whites, having carefully folded them in, you'll see that it's light enough now, it's, it, it's loose enough now that the last batch of egg whites are not going to be so difficult to fold in. So fold those in. Your volume has increased enormously. And, um, and that's sort of it. However... The difference between the recipe as it appears in my book, Naples at Table, published in 1998, I believe, could be you know, whatever, um, hard to find book, by the way, um, the difference between my recipe and the one that was nearly plagiarized, but not quite, <coughs> is that um, the woman who put it on her blog bakes it in a nine-inch springform pan and bakes it at 325 degrees on the bottom shelf, as I do too, by the way, or you know, the, bottom, uh, the lower third of your oven. For She says that hers comes out perfectly after 55 minutes. My recipe actually says it could take as long as 90 minutes, an hour and a half. Now I'm thinking that's not going to happen. So I, I did it exactly the way she said, which was baking in a nine-inch spring form, which you have buttered and lined the bottom with parchment. You don't want to – it's a delicate cake. You don't want to crack it when you're taking it out of the pan. By the way, you bake this until you see a crack on the top. And I, te I put a cake tester in mine, and it came out clean after 55 minutes. And another indication of doneness – is that you'll see the tiniest separation of the cake 
between the cake and the pan. Uh, certainly, once you t- if the cake is done, as soon as you take it out of the oven and it starts to cool, that will happen. But you want to look in the oven and see that there's a tiny separation. So all those indications were go for me. 55 minutes, there was a crack on the top. It was separating ever so slightly from the side of the pan, so I took it out. I think I would have liked this cake to bake another five to ten minutes. Listen, we weren't complaining. It, it was baked through, but the, the center was a little fudgy, not runny at all, though. And I must say, on the second day, and certainly on the third day, the center dried out, you know, it absorbed enough. The whole cake was delicious. I, I was better on the second day. Not not a freshly baked cake, not a cake to eat when it's freshly baked. I would definitely say make it, at the very least, make it in the morning and have it at night. But even better if you bake it one day and eat it the next. And I only covered it loosely with uh, aluminum foil. So looking at other recipes, it's interesting because the torta caprese is never a high cake. It's a relatively low cake. But mine came out nice and high. It's beautiful. Um, by American standards, it's gorgeous. Uh, by Italian standards, I think they might look at it a little skeptically because <laughs> it's so tall. But looking even at Giada di Laurentiis, who so makes exactly the same ingredients except only five eggs, and but she bakes it in a nine-inch pan. It comes according to the picture on her website. It's the same height as a real torta caprese. So I'm going to bake this cake again. We finished it by now. By the way, it was. It, it lasted a lot of days because we, we we exerted some self control, um, which we don't always. Um, and I'm going to bake another one, but this time I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but I'm going to put it in a 10 inch spring form, which is what my recipe in Naples a Table calls for. And I, I'm sure it'll come out the right height. Um, baking time, it should actually take a little 55 minutes should be right for that. And I keep wondering if these people are measuring their pans the same way I measure mine because my 9-inch pan makes a high cake, and I don't want a high cake. By the way, torta caprese is is usually, if not always, uh, finished off with powdered sugar. And they have stencils that say capri, <laughs> so when you buy this cake, it says copri on the top and powdered sugar. Usually it's the copri part is the, is the dark part, and the rest of it's white. It's a stencil. Uh, or it could say caprese. Or sometimes they don't even put the word capri or caprese on it. They just put a silhouette of the island itself, which everybody around there knows what a silhouette of copri looks like because you look out into the Bay of Naples and that's what you see, the silhouette of Capri in the distance. Or they put uh, an image of the Faraglioni. Now, the Faraglioni are these rocks that come out of the water all around Capri. And not all around, but on one side of Capri. And they are, uh, uh, the, uh, the Faraglioni are of myth. That's where the sirens uh, uh, used to hang out. Now, we know the, about the siren call. The sirens, we would call them mermaids. These days, they were, but they were not nice ladies. Um, in fact, the Little Mermaid in Italian is called uh, La Sirenetta, the Little Mermaid, is the Little Siren. And they used to, they had a call, the Siren Call, and it was to seduce sailors into their power. <laughs> And <laughs> the famous uh, story is that Ulysses, um, when he went by the Faraglioni, um sailing by in his ship, he had himself tied to the mast so he could hear the siren call but not respond to it. And all his men were required to wax up their ears so that they could not even hear the siren call. And the the uh, one piece of art that depicts this uh Myth, I have to call it myth. Didn't really happen. Is uh, has uh, uh, Ulysses tied to the mast with an enormous erection? So that's what the siren call did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
we of course the word siren like the noise an ambulance yeah. makes is is comes from the same uh, root. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only sirens I've heard are the ones when the police are pulling me over <laughs> and they don't Well there that's the siren. Yeah. yeah, but the sirens of Greek mythology uh they were iris- the, the call they the, the well you know it depends you know, there are movies uh where this is depicted and it's interesting to see how different directors <laughs> yeah. uh, imagined the siren call sometimes it's just beautiful music and sometimes it's ear splitting horrible sound <laughs> they were not nice the sirens <laughs> no you but think about chocolate cake my grand- i first of all i give so much uh, awards to people who who bake because I like to cook but I hate to bake because everything really if you want to do it right has to be as precise as it can be. Yes, this, you need to be not only precise but careful. Yeah, and I I'm not a precise person when it comes to cooking. And well, I'm not either, but you know uh, it's worth it for the result. Oh, my grandmother! I used to watch all the time. My grandmother, her sisters, and that's how I learned to make all these does the dishes and stuff. And my love of food and my love of getting fat. But uh, when you when she <laughs> they would make a chocolate cake, a chocolate yeah. cake especially, and it would come out of the oven hot. Right at that moment, it is the most wonderful thing in the world. But then you're right. The next day, when it sets in a little, it settles in. Yeah, yeah it's just it's even better. But yeah. it's, 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 well, I think I think that flour-based cakes. Um, although I think you're right too that you know the, we we often oh we have to have this cake as soon as it comes out of the oven. Well, you know what? It's much better when it's all cooled down. Right. We let we let steak we you, we let meat rest after it's you know and, and that's true. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. So you well, yeah. So it goes that if you let it rest and and settle in, especially as a cake, it's yeah. going to be better the next day with you know with. with Cup of milk, <laughs> cold milk, ice cream. And a, yes, and a glass of cold whole milk. Yep, <laughs> not the fake milk, not the fake milk. You're right. No, whole milk, not soy milk, not. You know, I keep wanting to try oat milk. Have you tried oat milk? No, because I I have something against all these oat milks and, and these uh, pine nut milks. They're not milk. Just call them just call them drinks because they're not milk. Well, milk I have milk. Two, two, uh, two, two Italian notes. By the way, I, I didn't mention her name, but the, the 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 woman. She was not a woman when I got this recipe twenty whatever years ago. She was still a teenager, I believe. Her name is Giovanna Tafuri, and Tafuri, by the way, is a very important name in in the city of Salerno. There are even streets called Tafuri, so she's of those Tafuris, um, and Giovanna, and um, I told you her her mother's name is Rosaria. And what was the other little note on this cake? It was something else. I don't remember. Oh, oh, yes, we were talking. So I have a friend in, also in Salerno. He's in the same family, by the way. Uh, we call him Jackie. His, that's, his real name is Joaquino. But so Jackie owns a, a, a cows and a dairy. And don't even mention soy milk to him. You will get a half an hour on how that's not milk. <laughs> That's true. And he'll name every other almond milk. No, it's not milk. <laughs> I tried to tell him here in the big brand of uh, of soy milk here is actually called silk. Yeah. So, yeah, because it's not milk. Not it's milk. Silk. Well, all right, all right. Well, I'm going to make this cake again. I'm going to – I'll report to you how it, it was any different in a 10-inch spring form. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm going to add vanilla this time since I have such great vanilla in the house. Uh, but another possibility, and this was in the plagiarized recipe, not really plagiarized, but only semi-plagiarized recipe. Uh, she got the one, the blogger, by the way, got the recipe from her mother, who her mother must own my book. And then the mother makes the cake, and she passes it on to the daughter, and now it's become the mother's recipe. <laughs> and, but the mother did add two tablespoons of Grand Marnier to the to the chocolate, <laughs> and I thought that was a really good addition because <laughs> I love orange and chocolate together. All right, hey, Arthur, all right. Have a great week, everybody. Don't bake too much. Just bake. Just bake and be safe. Okay, Arthur. We'll yeah, speak to you next week. We'll speak right. to you next week. Take care. Take care.
that is uh, Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, here on The Breakfast Club on Robin Hood Radio. Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, John Andrews Restaurant on the Hillsdale Road in South Egremont, 413-528-3467, on the web, jarestaurant.com. Rubiner's Cheesemongers and Grocers on Main Street in Great Barrington, 413-528-0488, rubiner's.com. Hillsdale Home Chef, more information, 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com. 